Thank you, Heather. We'll invite, you can maybe be seated. We'll invite the kids to come up for Bible story time. Hello, hello. All right, have a seat. Now, what Heather just read for us was the Palm Sunday story about Jesus entering Jerusalem. Have you heard that one before? Okay. Yep, but it's time to listen to the story. I actually have a different story to tell you about the first time that God came into Jerusalem. Now, God is everywhere all the time, but he also comes special in a special way. The first time that God came to Jerusalem was when David brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city. And that was like a whole thousand years before Jesus. And it was also a very happy day. Was it a happy day when Jesus came into Jerusalem? Yes. Mm -hmm. The people were rejoicing and they were waving palm branches and they had and they had, uh, they put their cloaks on the road, and they said, Hosanna, which is Hebrew for please save. Please save. Yep. Yep. Now, when the Ark of the Covenant came into Jerusalem, it was also a very happy day. And David was dancing because he was so happy. He was jumping up and down, and there was music, and it was a very happy occasion. They didn't celebrate that day of the year. We don't know what day of the year it was that the Ark of the Covenant came into Jerusalem. But we know that it came in, and we know that David was very, very happy. And he gave everybody some food to eat because he was so excited. And when the people were saying, Hosanna to the son of David, maybe they knew that Jesus was a king. But not all of them knew that Jesus was God. And that this wasn't just like David coming into the city. It was like the Ark of the Covenant coming into the city. Because the Ark of the Covenant was where God had promised to live. Eric, please scoot back. Not touch your brother like that. It's a happy day when God comes to visit us, isn't it? It's a happy day when we have company. But it's the very best if it's Jesus who's coming. And we want to be ready to welcome him. All right. Jesus is going to come back. And we want to be ready to welcome him. When he, you wish that Jesus came back today, I would be very happy for that too. But a lot of people wouldn't be ready. And that's why he's waiting. He's waiting so the most people can be ready. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you entered the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and we pray that you would also come and enter our hearts, and that we would be happy to receive you, and that we would be ready to receive you when you come again. Amen. All right, you can have a seat. The text for today, the sermon is Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. Reading in Jesus' name. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy upon you. He will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord your God and will 
and all his and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of the cattle, and the fruit of the ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers, when you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Very likely the book of Deuteronomy was written in one day, or at most a few days. Moses preached all of what was in Deuteronomy all at once. It was all one big event. And if, if we say that was last Sunday, well then by now Moses has died and the people of Israel are getting ready to cross the Jordan and begin the conquest under Joshua. And we did, we've read about Joshua already in our Bible readings for this week. We've got one more sermon in Deuteronomy before we cross the Jordan too in the sermons and enter the Promised Land. The structure of Deuteronomy could be described in a number of ways, but one way we can look at it is that chapters 1 through 3 are a historical introduction where God, where Moses reminds the people what God has done for them in the past, how, they've, how he's brought them to this point. Then chapters 4 through 26 are a, a lot of laws. Some of them are new, but many of them are repetitions of previous laws. And a lot of this material is especially geared toward the people in their present situation. They're about to enter the promised land. Here's some things you need to know when you get there. Kind of like if you get on a plane and the flight attendant reads, here's all the things you need to know in the situation that you're in the plane that you're in. But then we get to chapters 27 through 33. And broadly speaking, they are about the future. In particular, God tells the people about the blessing and the curse that will, there's going to be a ceremony that, that they'll have a blessing and a curse. And we talked about this in Sunday school this morning. There was a, the town of Shechem, or was later called Sychar, and that's where Jesus met the woman at the well, and that was down in the valley. And on one side was Mount Gerizim, and half the tribes were going to stand over there and read the blessing. And then the other half of the tribes were going to stand on Mount Ebal, which was just right across the valley over here. And they, had, they were supposed to build an altar there and pronounce the curse. Chapter 28, then, is a very, very long chapter that enumerates what God will do for the people of Israel if they obey him and what he threatens to do to them if they disobey him. And actually, Moses is unambiguous about the fact that they are going to disobey, and they're going to receive all of these curses sooner or later. It's not a matter of if, but of when. The blessings take up 14, the first 14 verses of chapter 28, and then the remaining 52 verses of the chapter are all of the curses. And they are very comprehensive. They promised misery and pain in personal and national life, economic affairs, military defeat, exile, barrenness, disease. There's not a lot of ways that someone could be cursed that God left unmentioned in this chapter. So it's against this backdrop that we come to our text for today, which is chapter 30. Moses has listed off the curses, and he's very clearly told them this is coming. You're going to get this sooner or later. But Moses also goes beyond the curses and offers them hope on the other side. And in doing so, he's stretching 900 years into the future. The Exodus was about 1446 BC. The northern tribes were exiled in 722 BC and the tribe of Judah in 606 and 586 BC to Babylon. Then Cyrus, king of Persia, allowed them to return in 536 BC to rebuild the temple. And the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are all written during that time period when they came back. And that lasted, Malachi was written about 444 BC. That's easy to remember. 
And then it would be 400 years or so until Jesus arrived. Moses was offering hope to these Israelites in the distant, misty future who were born in exile because of the sins of their parents, but who were also remembered and loved by the God of their forefathers. God called his people out of Egypt with power and might. Then he set them up. Okay, you're going to conquer this territory. You're going to have the tabernacle and later the temple and this whole system of a national life for the Israelites. And they, they did have a capital in Jerusalem and they built a temple and they had kings and they had an army and it was a grand thing. And then, as strange as it might seem to us, God destroyed all of that. It was all gone. It looked to the world like God's plan had failed, like he had been defeated. The holy people of God had been led into sin, just like Balaam intended when he advised the king of Moab to invite the Israelites into idolatry. Balaam's plan worked, both in the Exodus generation and also later in the exile. But we find here in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy that that was not the end of God's plan. And God made that clear to the Israelites even before any of it happened. Before they even crossed the Jordan, he's like, you're going to go in here, you're going to conquer it, you're eventually going to disobey and be cursed. And after that, there's something else still for you. God had another trick up his sleeve, so to speak. Thus we read in verse 1 that the scene depicted in chapter 30 will not take place until after all hope was lost. After everything had been corrupted, destroyed, and carried away. The Israelites who, for whom this text was intended would have had both the glorious history of Israel as well as its humiliating defeat in their rearview mirrors. But they're invited at just that juncture, verse 2, to turn to the Lord and obey his voice with all your heart and with all your soul. A couple of things that we should highlight about a, retur a person's return to the Lord. It's timing and it's scope. As far as timing goes, our text teaches us that today is not too late. Today is not too late. Here you are, sitting in church or watching online, and if God is calling you to return to him, you have this opportunity. It is not too late for you. When you die, then it is too late, but now is not too late. And that needs to be emphasized because the situation that Moses was addressing and in which some of you may find yourselves really needs this truth. You might feel like the Israelites who were born in exile that the Lord is done with you. Things may have gone poorly in your life and it feels as though he has turned his kind face away and instead given you nothing but beatings time and time again. Maybe you know you've deserved it. Maybe you feel like you didn't deserve it. But the result is you feel that God doesn't care, that it's too late for you to come to him. Dear friend, it is not too late for you. The Lord's arms are open wide, stretched out on the cross to welcome you even today. After all you've done, after all you've been through, come, return to him with all your heart and with all your soul. This business of heart and soul is the other thing that we should highlight from the verse. We find the refrain no fewer than three times in our text, verse 2, verse 6, and verse 10. In Hebrew, the word heart is lev, and it's used for the whole inner person. The term heart is a good English translation because that's the, the concrete signification of the word in both languages. Uh, the Hebrew word lev and the English word heart is the organ in your chest that pumps your blood everywhere. But the abstract signification of the word in English is a little bit different than what it was in Hebrew. Um, and Hebrew has a lot more words than English does that have both an abstract and a concrete signification. We have the word heart, 
and we use it for the organ, but we also use it to talk about our emotions a lot of times and our desires. Well, the Hebrew word for heart also talked about the organ, and it would, it would include your emotions and desires, but it also includes what we refer to as our mind, our, our thinking and our will and our decisions. All of that was included in the word heart in Hebrew. And sometimes, actually, the Hebrew language will use the word gut or bowels for your emotions. Like we'll say, I have a gut feeling. Sometimes the Hebrew language does it that way. So if we think about the word heart, when you see that in the Bible, you shouldn't just think English heart, your emotions and desires. You should also think mind, what we think of as being in our brain, the, your your thoughts and your will. The word for soul in Hebrew is nefesh, and it's kind of a complicated word. The concrete signification is breath or throat, and its abstract meaning is life or appetite. We might even use the word drives. The soul is the engine of our being. It's what moves us and enables us to live and desire. Now, I'm not prepared to give a whole explanation of how the Old Testament pictured the inner workings of a person, but just a little bit about these two terms helps us understand what Moses meant when he called the Israelites to return to the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. What we call our mind, as well as what we call our heart, should be reoriented to God as well as all of our drives, the aim of our whole life. And the New Testament calls this being born again. We're justified freely by his grace, and that much is plain by the fact that God extends his hand of mercy even to those sinful and afflicted people whose forefathers had lost everything that God had given them and merited all of the curses from chapter 28. But while we can distinguish theologically between justification by grace through faith on one hand and the new birth on the other hand, they're chronologically the same. The, the moment that you're born again, you're justified. And the moment you're justified, you're born again. It's the same, the same time and the same condition. The rest of our text takes this scenario of a repentant Israelite or a repentant Absalian and carries it forward. Most of the text is occupied with what God will do for such a repentant and born-again person. And sprinkled in the middle, in verses 6, 8, and 10, we have pictures of the new life in Christ, the life that believers will begin to live when they are born again. Verses 3 through 5 describe what God will do for these repentant Israelites in the material world. He will restore them, have mercy on them, gather them, bring them back to the land, and prosper them. In other words, he was prepared to give these repentant Israelites after the exile the same blessings in this life that he offered to give the Exodus generation and the Israelites who lived all the way through that time period. Verse 4 is meant as a special comfort that highlights what I said a bit ago about not being too late. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. In other words, not only is it not too late, you're also not too far away from God. Today, he is very near. You might feel like he is far away from you or that you are far away from him. And it is true that sin puts up a wall between us and God. But Jesus' death on the cross is our guarantee that the same thing can be true of each person here that it was for those Israelites many generations ago. You are not so far away that God can't 
bring you home. So, verses 3 through 5 are about blessings in this life. But as we move on to verses 6 through 8, we find that God has it in mind to give them spiritual blessings as well. And this is the distinction that we have to make when we're thinking about applying our text in Uppsala in 2024, in the year of our Lord. God has not promised you and I that we're going to prosper in this life if we obey him. He hasn't promised to give us land. Some of you own land. I don't. <laughs> but even the land that you own isn't in Israel, right? This, these promises don't all just carry over and land in our laps. The promises for the Israelites were a time and space example to the whole world of what God could do and will do for his people, especially in eternity. The spiritual blessings, however, that we find in verses 6 through 8 are much easier to carry over to our situation. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you, and you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. And the picture in those verses is the same as the New Testament picture of being born again. It's the same sort of spiritual blessings. God circumcises our hearts, that is to say he cuts off our sin and seals us as his holy people when we trust in him. The result is that we have a new heart and new desires a new love for God, and we begin to walk in obedience to him, and we live. And that's in verse 6. So that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, there it is again, that you may live. Our God is the living God, and his people are living people, people with a new life, people with an eternal life that begins when you trust in Jesus and lasts for eternity. God furthermore promises in verse 7 that he will curse the enemies of his believing people. And yes, that promise also holds true for believers in the New Testament. It's something that Paul discusses in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verses 5 through 10. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Sometimes these curses coming upon our persecutors will happen in this life. Uh, an example of that would be King Herod in Acts chapter 12 when God struck him with worms and he died. Other times, we simply must trust God, who is able to cast both soul and body into hell, that he will deal appropriately with those who oppress his believers. Verses 9 and 10 return to the Israelites in particular and offer them still more of the promises in this life on the condition of obedience, like the ones in verses 3 through 5. And like Moses describes both in chapter 28 and elsewhere in Deuteronomy, but sadly, those Israelites failed again. They were permitted to return from the exile, and they rebuilt the temple under the direction of Zerubbabel. And they rebuilt the city under the direction of Nehemiah. But they also sinned again. They were given so much, and yet when the Messiah came on the scene, our Lord Jesus 
by and large, they did not receive him. God had set everything up for his holy people and for them to receive the Messiah, but the majority shouted, crucify him, crucify him. They did not believe. Just like their forefathers in the Exodus generation, and again in the exile, the Israelites in A.D. 30 were hard-hearted and would not accept what God wanted to give them. It is true, many of them were converted at Pentecost and afterward. There was an awakening among the Jewish people through the preaching of the apostles, and many of them were saved. But the majority and the leaders rejected the Son, and thereby the Father also. And it was for this reason their nation was destroyed yet again in A.D. 70 by the Romans. The temple was burned to the ground, and it has never been rebuilt. Our epistle text from Romans, however, shows that God has not forgotten about the Jewish people altogether. Even though they had a chance in 1446 B.C. that they ruined, went into exile in 586, and then they got another chance in 536, and they ruined and went into exile again in A.D. 70, God still remembers the promises he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The book of Romans does not offer the Jews another chance to receive blessings in this life on condition of obedience. But it does predict that as the return of the Lord approaches, many Jews will avail themselves of God's mercy through Jesus the Messiah. Many of them will come to receive the same blessings that you and I can receive when we trust in Jesus. And like we discussed in verses 6 through 8. Paul, the apostle for the Gentiles, also longed for the conversion of Israel, and he preached to the Jewish people wherever he went. And we can see that, this, that the salvation of the Jews by their conversion to Christ is taking place today. Our friends at Chosen People Ministries have observed the trends. A greater percentage of Jewish people are turning to Jesus today than they ever have, as far as we have a record of it. It's an exciting time to live, and we should anticipate Jesus' return. We're called to live ready any day for Jesus to come back. And really, there's nothing more or less to being ready than trusting him for the forgiveness of sins and walking with him, just as our text describes. Amen. And let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that today is not too late. Jesus has not yet returned, and we are all of us alive this day. This is a day of grace, a day on which you are waiting for someone to repent. And I pray that if anyone, whether here or online, has heard your word and your invitation today to come and live, that it would not be too late, but that they would come. And then we pray that you would keep all of those who trust in you safe in your care until you do come, so that you would find us ready ready to receive the blessings of eternity, to which both the spiritual blessings we've received and the earthly blessings that the Old Testament Israelites at times received will be fulfilled forever and ever. For we ask it in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand, if you're able, for our closing hymn, number 95, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. <laughs> 